Hello, everyone. Uh, good morning. Good afternoon. In fact, for many of you, it's late in the evening for Europe. Thanks for joining to our second in the series of podcast of Next Generation Enterprise. Uh, for many of you, you may, uh, I don't know how many of you have joined in the first podcast. Uh, I am a big fan of Star Cow and Star Wars. And if you have seen the future of spaceship, Next Generation Enterprise, it travels us across the space. I took a leaf out of it, and that's how we created the Next Generation Enterprise. So our goal was, you know, uh, we want to do a podcast, but basically the technology, the world, you know, thanks to the unfortunate situation we are in, um, the world has become one virtual flat world. It's, it's very different. Technology is transforming at a rapid pace. What does it mean to us? What does it mean to the young generation? What does it mean to the older generation? How do we adapt? How do we have those soft skills? And this is how we start the podcast. And with this in mind, we wanted to talk to the C-suite, the VPs, how can we take this to the next level? And we have decided to go around the globe to speak to various people about the cultures and how we can be productive. With that, I would like to give a big shout to the and Lasse for accepting my invite. Welcome Deepak and Lasse, it's such an honor to have you. Um, the floor is set for you. Perfect. Uh, I, uh, it, it's fine. Go ahead. <laughs> okay, hi, I'm, I'm Lasse Rindam. I am uh, the Chief D Digital Officer for Big Tilly Denmark. Uh, I'm really happy to be here. Thank you, Ramesh, for, for inviting me uh, to, your, to your new uh, uh, podcast series here or webinar series that you're doing. Uh, on who I am, I am a, a professional that has moved from, uh, from RPA and automation basically into becoming a more digital, uh, broad digital suite uh, professional today where I'm leading up the both internal and external uh, part of the Becatilly Denmark uh, operation. On, on digital. So what I'm what I what I do is that I sort of connect uh, systems uh, on top of systems. So with all these different technologies that is available for doing that, I we use uh, RPA, we use BI, we use uh, machine learning technologies, APIs, uh, low code application platforms, all these different technologies. So basically saying that I'm the on top of systems kind of guy, uh, which is what I'm doing. I'm actually a major in history, so some of my lines in 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 when I look at where things are going, where they've come from, I, I tend to I tend to always have the long the long glasses on. You know, uh, I'm using uh, I'm an ocular. So yeah, that's a one eye one, right? Thank you. Thanks, Lasse. Deepak. Hey everybody, I'm Deepak Upadhyay. I am a partner with Bakery in Canada, uh, and I lead the digital uh, risk and technology practice for Bakery in Canada. Digital risk and technology is everything to do with technology and the digital side of technology. Um, so everything starting as Lassi said from process automation, uh, machine learning, AI, through to on a risk side, you know, cybersecurity risk associated with hyper automation and how do companies uh, manage through all of these. In a previous role, I was a CIO for a large public sector organization in Canada and one of the projects that I worked on was actually helping this organization go from a very traditional, very uh, typical infrastructure and IT department to then really embracing digital and then being more in the digital front. So I've kind of leave the world as it comes to digital transformation. I've, I've, I've had that experience. I have the scars to show the fact that I've been battled through the digital transformation. And so I think now working with the C-suite kind of helps uh, yeah, provide uh, ideas in terms of what worked well for us and what didn't work so well. So they appreciate some of the insights that we bring having lived in their world, so to speak. Now I look forward to speaking to all of you and learning a little bit more myself. Uh, you know, one of the qualities that you absolutely need to have is to be a lifelong learner. So as you're participating, you're learning yourself. So look forward to this discussion. Great, Deepak Lasse. Uh... Uh, that's phenomenal, and I've seen your backgrounds. For people, you know, I would strongly suggest to have a look on the background of Deepak and Lasse. is phenomenal. So, so Lasse and Deepak, uh, obviously, we are from CTO Academy, so we do have a vested interest of everybody should be a CTO. Uh, the question that I have is, we have, we've always had the traditional. I think you know we were a happy C-suite with just a CIO, CTO, CEO, CFO. Why do we need a chief digital officer? Probably we'll start with Lasse and then go to Deepak. 
Well, I, th I think I think actually basically, and uh, and uh, I think me, me and Deepak also discussed this earlier. Is that that I, I think that the resilience of the CIO role will will sort of survive. I think the CTO and the CDO. I'm I'm sorry, now you're CTO Academy, but I think CTO is is a state is a statement C suite. Uh, role basically it's i think the cto is a response to disruption that everyone was talking about 10 years ago uh it, it, it's about you know talking about technology or thought we'll be hit by technology i've always been a little bit you know enthused by that saying that how how can you on how could you you know the point of disruption is that you're disrupted you know you don't know what hit you so how can you you know say well now we invest in a role to prepare us not to be surprised when the element of surprise is, is the center of it anyway but but the thing is to get some kind of technology officer in to say like, what what's new what innovative new technologies can we add to our stack and do that uh, and instead of just cio which was just about information like all of it but it's a very well entrenched role the cto sort of came in with a push from the side saying that now i'm speci specifically focusing on this uh, this area of new technology new innovations I think what a lot of company learned from that uh, probably was that uh, that it's really difficult to optimize a lot of the core processes if you haven't thought about getting your data digital at first. So I think today everyone's just talking about the digital push, right? It's a digital transformation. Um, we've been doing that for 30, 40, 50, 60 years, right? Getting digital. But but everyone now understands that in order for us to sort of move into the next world, we need to get everything into a digital format. Meaning that I don't think that my role is necessarily to add the new technologies. I'm not just focused on new technology and new innovative technologies in the market. I'm focused basically on let's just get it digital. So if we can, if I can just get my data into an SQL database, I've basically, uh, if you like, I can say, the whole company is operating on a minimum of just some you know data warehousing or even excel <laughs> then we've succeeded to some extent you know from uh, not having stamps and paper and, and i think that's the statement of the chief digital officer saying that we really need to fix this now we should have fixed it 10 years ago we really need to fix it today i, I do like your analogy of transferring data from an excel to a sql server or an oracle database and call it a digital transformation that's a great one uh, so are we saying so far we have digitized, but not truly, is that a fair statement, Lassie? Oh, what did you say? We have, I, I lost you on the, on the connection. Yes. We have digitalized, so, but not truly. Uh, well, I said, did we digitize or did we get, are we getting now digital with COVID? You know, so far we've always been talking of digital transformation. It sounds like we have only digitized, but not been a digital like providing a context to why we are transferring to SQL Server, the, the context and the analogy is what we were missing in the past. I think everyone's been forced a little bit digital now, right? Everyone, that it's going a lot faster. Everyone's realizing that everything they didn't do digital, in everything that was you know analog, paper, and manual processes, they are sort of lacking when people are sent home. You know, some things are missing, some things are not working well because you know sent home, you can only connect with what's digital. So you know the push has become even greater, and I think the the chief digital officer is a role that will grow over the next couple of years. Due to that, uh, we need to get at least things digitalized you know everyone working in ai or with ai are touching upon uh, concepts of ai machine learning they realize very quickly that we can it's it we have the you we could you could use this technology right but we don't have you know uh, uh, data integrity we don't have enough data available we don't have the last three years data available and they're not in the same format if we have it available uh, that this this is a key problem for getting into the new technologies that's there right so that's why i'm saying let we need to fix the base first let's get digitalized and i think everyone who's been a consultant here uh, in in this audience as well has seen that we go to clients we see it's not digital it's just it's still analog I have I had a, a talk with someone the other day who has a web shop, digital web shop. Then they take it out and pay, print it out in paper when they get an order in. Then they move it around uh, in different system, type it in and move it around in paper. And then they put it in digital again for the invoicing part, right? It's like, so some things are just not connected and some things, there's the logics there that we need to fix before we can even talk about disrupting, disruption, you know? I think further to what Les has said, you know, it's just also the skill sets are a little bit different, right? So you, so you need the person that understands digital format, that understands that, that the data that's coming through is now more in a digital manner, right? So traditionally, uh, as last year say, you'd have a paper invoice that comes through and somebody would sit there and type in that paper invoice. Now all that is no longer analog. It's now coming through digital and COVID's accelerated the adoption of uh, the, the type of information flow that's coming through that's 
primarily digital as opposed to analog. And not only that, but it's also the volume, right? Like the amount of information that's available now that flows through an organization is so uh, humongous and the amount of volume is just so much out there that you need to kind of understand what is real, what is important to you, the mission of the organization, the noise. So the, the, the C-suite really then stays focused on what is the mission of the organization? What are we trying to achieve? And then the chief digital officer is then providing that data and providing that input, which is strategic. It has been sieved through everything else that's out there that, that people talk about. And, and so that the organization, the C-suite can really remain focused on driving the business forward with the specific uh, mission that they have. Yeah, and on, on, on that, I'd also like to add that, you know, it, it's the same thing, basically, but saying that, I think data transformation is often about two things, right? It's about insights, and then it's about effectivity, right? But first of all, and and then, you know, the, the biggest of all is if, if it's insights. You need to know what's going on. You need to know what your key drivers, what are your cost drivers, what are your uh, what are your revenue streams, and where do you get your money from? What, what clients are bad? What clients didn't you follow up on? And so on and so forth, right? And if you don't have these data digitalized, you cannot really drive your business strategy, and you can to see what what streams should we what should we stop doing and what streams should we affect uh, you know optimize and make more effective with digital tools so and and i think covid and that's you said that and we also discussed that deepak earlier this covid made analog a risk really and that's why you know it links over to 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 deepak's area of risk management as well right because of covid we saw that analog processes were suddenly a risk a really big risk because they weren't performed i think that is a key thing. Risk is a key thing, right? I will touch upon the context of risk, Deepak, but let's say that's great. So uh, this is actually good, a very good conversation what we're having. You know, COVID has highlighted two things, if it were. One is the risk, second is the business continuity. Uh, Deepak, I know you're a big digital transformation evangelist. Can you touch a little bit about risk and business continuity? Are they separate? Are they inseparable? How do you see that? Absolutely. You know what? I think they're inseparable. I think risk, value creation, business continuity, all of those uh, aspects are just different aspects of the same coin, really. So, you know, if we talk specifically about business continuity, I've seen a lot of organizations that have actually not been able to survive, unfortunately, the current search just because of the fact that they are so manual so dependent on physical, on physical location, physical people, physical processing, right? So, so that, you know, I have a client here that was primarily aggregating invoices and uh, was responsible for ensuring that the payables are met and then he'd take a, a certain commission off of the payables. And he had an army of people literally accepting invoices that vendors sent out physical copies of invoices and then they were putting them in. And unfortunately, that entire model has been completely changed now because there is nobody that can process those physical paper. Another classic example would be like the mail, right? Like the amount of mail, physical mail or snail mail that was going through has reduced so much now, such that you know in the UK and, and, and in Canada, we had physical post office, like businesses of people that were actually operating as post offices who were processing that physical mail and that again, business model has completely gone out of the door. And COVID just accelerated that, right? It's made it worse so that people who are primarily reliant on physical and analog activities are now really finding it very difficult to, to move forward. So as part of your business continuity, one of the key things is, is digital transformation and ensuring all that data that's coming through that was previously analog can now be digitalized. Yeah, thanks, Deepak. Uh, we have a question from one of our audience, Tolani. So she uh, she is asking, how do we see with this new digital transformation or with this virtual world? Is there a convergence with the roles of a chief executive officer, a chief data, a digital officer, and a chief technology officer? Actually, we, I'm not bringing deliberately, but I'm also talking of chief data officer. Are we seeing the lines blurring between a CIO, a chief? Well, so. When I say CDO, many people think chief digital officer, but the data side people think it's a chief data officer. So there's a CIO, CDO, there's a chief data automation officer, there's a chief data analytics officer, there's a CTO. Are the roles more becoming more narrow or are they becoming converging? How do you see this? 
I, I, uh, I think that I, I, say, I think I mentioned just a bit about that earlier as well. Yeah. But uh, the, the way I see it is that I think I think the the CIO is the role you'd go for in the long run. Basically, I think that will be the one that will survive uh, down the line. I think it has uh, credence and has a historical thing to it. So it's it's it has. Um, it has enough impact in the market to stay there. You know, it's all about genealogy and words and how they use the power of the word, blah, blah, blah. And CIO has something to it. So I think that will be the one that will sort of keep on going. I think also it's important that you don't mess up your C-level suite. You know, you have someone responsible for all of it. So the CIO should always be, you know, the, like the, you know, you don't want to have a, a CFO and then a chief, at, uh, a chief uh, you know, accounts payable officer as well, right? The, the C-level should be some kind of something, you know, unique for an area, for a, for a column of, of services. But what I said earlier was that I think that the, the digital or the data or the technology officer is a statement, you know, that you're saying that, okay, the CEO now thinks that it's really important that we look at new technologies to avoid disruption. So now we hire a CTO to refer directly to the CEO, right? And the same thing with the digital here is that you're hiring a CDO to to make sure there is an emphasis on getting digitalized that can sort of put a check on the CIO as well to move forward with that. So I, I think that's how you use them, right? Uh, like a chief procurement officers as well, right? Sometimes they're there and sometimes they're just uh, ahead of procurement below the CFO. It's, it's all about what do you think is, uh, is an important focus right now? And then you create a C-suite uh, as, or a C-level uh, role for that. Cool. Does that answer your question, Tolani? Yes. Or uh, Deepak, yeah, what do you say? Absolutely. I, I think also further to what Lassie said, and, and you know, in addition, in agreement with what he's saying, the focus area and the skill sets are a little bit different, right? So if you look at the CIO, traditionally the, the CIO was focused on how do I get all this information in, regardless of how that information gets processed, hence the title information officer was primarily focused on ensuring the flow of information between processes, between organizations, et cetera. The chief technology officer typically was focused on, okay, now how do I either supplement or work with all the process flow and information, but do it in a manner that's efficient and such that my technology architecture, the way I process that data is efficient and, and, and effective. Whereas now the chief digital officer has got to think with a completely different head, has got to think with a completely different mindset. So while traditionally, you know, the CIO would say, okay, let's go and buy a server and create an on-premise server firm. The chief technology officer would have said, you know what, let's not do this in-house let's just co-source it or host it or have our servers be based you know, at a service provider. And now with the chief digital officer, they've got to completely reinvent that thinking and say, how do I go cloud first? Do I even need a server firm? Can I just go to AWS or Azure or Google or whatever, think from a cloud point of view such that my investments is no longer even on creating my own infrastructure. I'm going to just be natively digital. I'm going to be out there you know, on, on, on the cloud with AWS or with Azure and then create my processes and infrastructure around that. So I'm no longer focused on just the technical architecture or the flow of information and process, but I'm now traditionally starting ground up from being digital. So I think the focus and, and the way you go about uh, approaching that role is slightly different. Now there's a lot of overlap and one role can easily uh, blend into the other, but you know the focus is slightly different in my opinion. I think so, also that uh, I agree with you on that, Deepak, a lot. And I think also that you know, uh, I used to use a picture of of uh, my own little layer thing uh, is uh, you know to use a, a world, you know, a globe, and saying that the, the core of a world is sort of the infrastructure, the crust is the systems, core systems, and then you have sort of an atmosphere layer of uh, RPAs and BIs and and uh, low code application platforms and stuff like that to sort of connect or move around. But but you know everything is more dependent on the below as you go upright so that 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 makes sense in that, that way of seeing it and i think the cio traditionally has a, the responsibility for the whole is like the whole globe right but yeah. then you can sort of split it up into different ones so i think maybe you know have an infrastructure guy being a sea level you want to have a special sea level have a systems guy have a and then in the atmosphere we've now created the technology officer and now the digital officer it's something is moving around there but i, I think the as a whole this world is is the cio world uh and then I know it's called information, but I think it just became more when it became about service as well. You know, it, it became something different, very yeah, physical IT, right? So and it's still physical, actually, even though it's in cloud. I just want to say cloud is it's just someone else's basement, right? Someone else's basement, right. So, so true, <laughs> Lassie, you, you've touched some pretty touch points. 
So I'll take a slightly trivial question was, you know, you and I were always poking. So let's talk a little bit about this chief atmosphere offset that you created in New York. <laughs> No, but I think that, you know, I, I, I'm, I'm completely, I've been working, my, my career is working in, in the atmosphere, basically. So in this picture of the core and the cross, right, I'm, I'm an atmosphere kind of guy. I really like to breathe there and to change things around and be do it quick and easy, right? I'm not the guy sitting there doing, you know, a, a long, uh, what do you call it, uh, incremental changes in an SAP environment or something. That's not, that's not what I do, but I like to put the, the solutions on top of things to make it move faster and, and then communicate to the SAP guy what we need to change in the long run, right? Uh, so that's why I said to you as a joke too that that uh, maybe we should have a chief atmosphere officer like that, right? It also sounds. And then the cloud officer should be chief nebula officer, and we can go on like that. <laughs> so I'm going to touch a little bit about them, but before I so we have two questions. Is uh, actually I'll touch on the culture. So how do you when the automations are talking about digital, um, it's the most abusive a blatantly abused word. How do you overcome this most abused word? Like you said, you know, you, I turned on, on a database and I called it, yeah, I'm digital. So we have, we have horribly abused it so much. So now if we are talking a true digital transformation, like the classic example you said, we put an automation system, but then you pulled out an invoice in a spreadsheet and then you went to Deepak, Deepak scanned it and then they posted it into the GL. So this is a classic example of we think we were digital, but we only digitized. So how do you overcome this kind of obstacles? Sure. So I can take a crack at that. And then Lassie, I know you have uh, some some uh, some real insight into, into the, some of the experience that you have. But, and but you can talk forever, about. Deepak, right? <laughs> I know. That's why I thought I'd, I'd put my word in first before you... Before you. <laughs> Yeah, no, I think I think it's really about not just thinking inside the box, but really thinking about the whole ecosystem, right? So when you're talking about digitalization, then you're really thinking about, okay, now I get this invoice that's coming as a paper form, how do I make it electronic? Whereas when you're really starting to change culture and you're really starting to go through that digital transformation, it's not just about you and about the format in which your info information is being received, but it's about how do I bring the ecosystem along? And, and I know Lassie has got some very good ex experiences as we were talking about earlier. It's about connecting the different pieces. It's about connecting the players. It's about bringing the entire uh, supply chain, if you want, uh, and vendors and sub vendors and, and you know, just making sure that you're not just focused on that one thing, but you're focused on the entire ecosystem. And also importantly, you're focused on your customers. What does, what does my client want? Who is my ultimate client, right? And classic example is uh, Starbucks. When Starbucks first started talking about uh, digital transformation, one of the first things they did was they started automating their, their internal processes so that they could start gathering the data. And then that data was then driving uh, the decisions that they're making in terms of, okay, now if we are seeing that, you know, uh, when the temperature is 10 degrees, everybody orders a, a hot coffee, and if the temperature goes up to 25 degrees and everybody wants a cool drink, right? So receiving that kind of data through the internal automation systems then help them extend that experience further to their clients. So now the clients are starting to interact with um, the internal processes. Then they put out the digital online ordering app, for instance. So now I can actually order my coffee even before I get to the office. I'm ordering my coffee on my phone using an app that order is now automatically received in a physical Starbucks location that's near my office. So when I go to my office, I can just stop by my Starbucks, pick up my coffee because they made it so easy for me to do that. I'm not going to go to my office coffee machine. I'm going to go to the Starbucks, pick up my coffee and then go into the office. So just evolving and changing the entire experience rather than it being a physical interaction of where I'd have to physically get up and go to the shop. I can now order it online on my app pick it up on my way to the office and, and that drives my behavior. So it's about changing the way people think, changing the way they behave uh, by, by use of data and automation. Alassi? 
Yeah, yeah, I agree. I agree a lot with that, actually. And I think also that that it's not just been about, you know, changes and people going bankrupt in this scenario. I've talked to a very, very surprising talk I had was uh, the other day with a with a, a shrink uh, that uh, that actually increased her her customers. She could now have customers. A lot of the customers she had with anxiety didn't like to come in actually to consultation, but they liked, you know, the online Zoom meetings instead. So and now she could even take clients that were like 400 kilometers away or more than that from her location. So it actually increased her business. I think that was a, a very interesting perspective also on what you could do when you actually digitalize some some uh, some businesses that we didn't think could be digitalized in that way, right? Um, but but on the other on the question based specifically, I think that the, that the, that the, what digital has always been a little bit weird to me. It also becoming you know a, a chief digital officer is like okay, this it sounds like you know digital watches, you know, eighties thing. It sounds uh, it sounds old, it sounds dated. It is dated. I think it is dated actually. Uh, I've, I've had so many instances i think a lot of people have where we've come out to so a process they need to be optimized and they're doing something manually in excel that's you know the new manual is excel work and you're like, like optimizing it with like sql right you're putting a sql database to it and you're optimizing it this is like a 60 year old 70 year old technology basically right and it's driving it was in the first atms and everything you know it, it's, there's nothing new to it that's what i'm trying to say so so digital is is a weird old term coming back and being a little bit like i feel like i'm a part of tron when i'm saying i'm a digital you officer right? it's like driving way. it's like yeah. daft punk and tron all over right but i think that what um uh, what what the, I think the digital transformation has been overused a little bit as the concept in the market in general. Everyone's talking about digital transformation, like everything done with a system is suddenly digital transformation. I think what we need to really look at, if we look at this from 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 you know end to end, as and and, and now now my historian comes back a in a bit, right, is to say that what, what what characterized the first industrial revolutions that we had, it was like you could take your business and change it around, but just by exchanging a bit or moving, you know, uh, when you had the carriers back uh, 100 years ago, you bought a car and you got rid of your carrier and you were now part of the new automobile, you know, in, industry 3.0. You were sort of move transformed, da da, fixed it, right? The digital transformation is not that simple. It's a really a lot more about the, not just not just the culture, not just technology. It's about um, something stretching beyond your business. I think that's, that's a key thing. I think people need to understand that you cannot just take this system in and change your business with that system because you're not dependent just on your own business. And this is where me and Deepak, uh, we were working with a lot of SMB market, the SMBs, right, of the world. And and they are these peck in the middle kind of enterprises. They have uh, tons of key vendors on top of them and they have a lot of sub vendors below them, right? And they need to interact with them. And they also have public sector systems they need to interact with on the other side. And connecting these things, you know, uh, is about, is about the digital transformation. This company could not just change their own ERP system and be digital transformed. They have to also change the public system. They have to change the key accounts. They have to change the sub vendors as well. Or they need to put RPA to interact with them if it's even digitally possible, right? Does that make sense? So, Perfect. so for so, me, it's like it, it's it's a it's a it's a it's a it's a global. It's a nationwide. It's a uh, we have to transform society, right? To, to do the digital transformation. Don't just buy a tool. You don't digital transform, transform anything with RPA. For instance, I, I've worked a lot with RPA and been in that space for a long time. Yeah. There's no digital transformation in that, but it's it, it's the, the last you know, right. remedy. If you cannot connect with APIs or anything else, you can do it with RPA. And that's where RPA is something special in this digital transformation because it connects some things that cannot connect, right? And that's also why, you know, I'm so sick and tired of all these, sorry, I'm, I'm ranting now, but I'm, I'm so sick and tired of all these books about digital transformation, I'm always taking the point of the big companies, you know, then Walmart did this, then uh, Starbucks did this, uh, then uh, uh, the Procter & Gamble did blah, 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 and so on. But no one's really, and they all saying like, we enforced this system and pushed it on our sub vendors. Okay, next question. What did the sub vendors do, you know? The one that that delivered fruit to Walmart. He also delivered fruit to Aldi, and Aldi did the same. They also forced him to use their system. So now he has two, or three, four, five different systems, and he's not digitally transformed. He's just confused. He has no control of his business plan, and his OTC is a mess. Yeah, Lassie. So th this is actually great. We'll do a little bit divergence. So you know, the world has become one. You, we all agree that digital transformation has accelerated. But what is actually happening is the wear and tear. People are almost glued around the clock to the laptops. They're working crazy. You know, there's fundamentally the shift. So it's a three-part question. The world has become a flat. 
The problem is we're all virtually connected, but is there a connection between people? That's my first question. Secondly, you know, take this example. I'm in US, you're the part in Canada. Let's say you're in Denmark. It's great we're connected, but where is this empathy between us? How do we connect? How do you see this problem being fixed or do you see this being even more compounded in the modern era we live in? So it's funny, funny you mentioned that the last night I was just on another call earlier where we were just talking about some of the challenges of communicating over a Zoom call or over a video conference, but also some of the advantages and some of the plus points, right? So doing this physically, right? Having all these people from Ireland and England and, and you know, North America, Canada, US, Denmark, all of them be physically in one spot, like without having Zoom. A year ago, you would physically have to travel to a location that was convenient to everybody. Everybody would then have to book hotels, flights, you name it. All of the logistics that, that go along with, um, you know, locating, being physically lo in one spot, all of us together. And then, you know, even then there's no guarantee that everybody's going to be able to make it. Whereas now it's so much more convenient. Everybody, regardless of where they're physically located, can just hop onto a Zoom or a teams and, and, and communicate. So I think that's the advantage. And then, you know, you, you kind of talked about um, the empathy. I think, and last thing I was again talking about this, now you start to see the kids popping into the Zoom call or the dog <laughs> barking or, you know, so that really starts to kind of create that connection. And, and typically we would not get that. You would not see my kid. You would not know that I have a dog. But because now we're in the Zoom, it, it lets, some of the, the, the walls that we'd build up around our personal life and our corporate life come down a little bit because now you are in my living room or in my basement, as my, the case might be. You're seeing my kids, you're seeing my dog. You know, it's, it's creating that additional point of connection and empathy, uh, which perhaps you might not have had in, in a physical world. So I, I think there's pros and cons. I think generally there's more uh, pros than cons, but you know, managing the burnout, managing the 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 uh, time that it took you to travel from, and that was my da my downtime, my distress time was the time between the office and, and and coming home. You know, I'd have to be driving or I'd be on public transit uh, on a train, and that helped me de-stress and kind of you know really switch off and disconnect between work and 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 home. Whereas now it's like I just gotta go upstairs, or you know everybody's right there all the time, so it's very hard for me to switch off. So I think that that's probably the con and, and that's where you've got to start uh, creating more mindfulness and creating that space where you're able to disconnect and, and switch off. So sure. Uh -huh. yeah. I think yeah, also that uh, that uh, you know the thing that we're not we don't have this bridge anymore between uh, between the generations necessarily, right? That you can sort of say that uh, that the uh, ten years ago sending an email to your grandmother was a statement, or at least fifteen years ago, or twenty years ago when I was a, a young a teenager, it was a statement, you know, and being a little bit aggressive, and she wouldn't read it, and she wouldn't even have an email address, right? But today it's like with COVID also being accelerated a lot, you know, Zoom meetings are, no, are the new normal and and ordering groceries online, you know, even uh, even my grandmother does that, right? Actually, my yeah, second last point, last point, point, it becomes a convenient that my grandmother now loves it. She no longer wants to get out of her house to order groceries. No. She now just wants to get on the computer, order groceries, and have it be delivered. So there's, it's again creating that shift and change in, in customer behavior. So has Zoom created a fatigue? So I, actually, my younger one, he's seven years old. He asked me, Dad, was Zoom created for a pandemic? I was like shocked, but I started laughing that it was Zoom created for a pandemic reason. Yeah. So because all the schools use Zoom. So uh, I think um, um, she had a very interesting thing is, aren't we tired of Zoom as well? It's great. Are we tired of the Zoom? Yes, it has. It has created some, some sense of fatigue. And, and it's that all sense of always being available, I think, more than anything else, because now everybody's available on Zoom. So all the conferences now on Zoom, knowing that people are going to be more available and more present and more be able to participate. And as a result of that, more people are attending more conferences and more calls. So yes, eventually you are going to get to a point where you don't want to see another Zoom call. Like literally, I've been on calls since 8.30 this morning, and it's like 11 o'clock and back-to-back -back Zoom or conference calls or whatever. 
Um, so it does create a little bit of that fatigue where I don't ever want to see another Zoom call again. But it, you know, you got to think about the glass half full, it being that I would never have been able to do this before. So yes, you do have to do that, and you have to manage it a little bit, just as you would manage anything else, right? You know, you you typically have your personal assistant uh, screen all the calls, so you're only getting the important calls. Unfortunately, now that's no longer the case. So you're getting everything, and and so you got to manage that a little bit better, a little bit different. Sure, uh, I will touch um, <clears throat> in the interest of time. Two more questions. So uh, this is more apt. This is the first time we have uh, where the baby boomers to the Gen Z are working together. You know, very different. So you have not just a culture difference, but a generational, a huge generational difference. Compounding to that, you know, we the traditional guys were used to Excel based, and now the modern youngsters are low code based. How do you see this gap being bridged from our digital transformation? How, how are, you know, obviously you being at the C-suite, how are you helming this kind of transnational or transcendental gap that's all the way from generations? I feel that the, 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 I, don't, I don't feel the bridge uh, that steep actually at the moment. I think everyone, at, at least also, you know, accelerated by COVID again, uh, is realizing that we need to, to change things. Um, of course, we've seen the the we still see the reluctant uh, uh, CFO or uh, or CIO uh, that's been at the company for a long time, uh, uh, and that's been part of the the older solutions. We we see that all around, but I think everyone knows that yeah, we need to change to adapt to things. And I also think that you know, as we talked about, having the grandmother order her groceries online is sort of changing. The, the entire culture of this is so saying that everyone realizes now that this is here to stay and it is something we interact with and this is something that we can that can actually help us um, fix a lot of things in our in our in our world I am um, I, I, I don't see it as that big a divide actually I I think uh, I think I think the real the real question we are gonna have right now in in the next uh, in next in the next um, next couple of years is to discuss what is an enterprise, you know, when people are at home working from home, right? People are working from home, they're not in the company. What is an enterprise? You know, if you read uh, Harari, you all know Harari with uh, Sapiens, the book he, he wrote, uh, and uh, Homo Deus is just talking about, you know, the enterprise is a construct, right? And now we're not even there. We're just uh, sort of uh, aligning with a construct uh, sitting from home doing what on a Zoom call, right? And uh, the company is driven by uh, government subsidies, uh, subsidies on digital printed money that they're just making in the central mm -hmm. bank. And the banks are uh, even more and more governed by public regulation as well it's like the enterprise is, is is becoming an account right in a global financial accounting system right it's 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 i think there's something weird going on that's that's just what i'm saying it's a it digital di digitalizing is, is making us all digits as well right uh, and i think that's what we're going to be asking about a little bit more down the line what what are we working for and who are we working for it yeah. great i think okay. it's also increased the comfort of being digital right so so the, 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 the millennials and the Gen Ys are were already comfortable with being digital. You know, they had their second life uh, uh, app where they could actually transform themselves into digital avatars. And they were very comfortable with that digital avatar interaction, you know, with, with uh, the headsets and, and all the rest of it. Whereas the baby boomers were perhaps not as comfortable being in a, in a digital environment. But now because of COVID, because of the fact that they can't be physical, they are also becoming now digital. And, and you know, it's funny, I was reading about IIT and how they had their entire graduation ceremony for their cohort all online, where they actually digitalized uh, the professors and the dean. These are people who would typically not be as comfortable with in being in an, in an avatar. And they made avatars of these people and the dean was actually physically giving the avatar of the student that physical graduation certificate, right? And so it just, it, as last said, it's, it's, there isn't that bridge anymore. It's, it's, we are all one, we're comfortable with being in, in a digital environment, in a virtual environment. And now uh, how do we, what's going to be the next step? How are we going to stretch the boundaries? Geographies and physical location is no longer a consideration. It's funny, I was actually speaking to you as part of an interview with a recent university graduate that we want to hire. And he was saying, oh, I'm getting offers from you know, Estonia, because they're very, very focused on, on driving the digital transformation. But he doesn't have to locate to Estonia. He can be in Canada, but still be working with uh, an organization that's in Estonia or an organization that's in Australia or, or you know, the US. 
the, the physical location no longer matters. It's all about being virtual and being online. Great. So um, one last concluding question is we're out of time is what's your word of advice for the youngsters and for people who want to grow in their careers, especially as a CEO or a CTO, or how do they grow? Well, I think the obvious obvious answer is that the the C level is a, is a strategic level, right? So you need to get into strategy. You need to think the big picture. You need to think, uh, you know, about customers and clients and and vendors. You know, you have to have that that thought of it. You have to look at the process in a very uh, ideal typ typical way of just you know input process output on a very high level. So for me, it's like uh, I, I like to say one thing, you know, that you should. Uh, you, sh you should make sure that your C-level is a guy who actually knows what he's C-leveling, right? So he has to have a background. I'd like to say that for a CIO or a CDO or a CTO, have some kind of background as a solution architect or uh, or an enterprise architect or, or something like that. And you can also come from, you know, development, whatever. But uh, I'm just saying that if you choose a guy who's just good at procurement or sales, then you, that's what you get, right? You get what you hire. And I see a lot of companies doing that. I think it's a mistake sometimes that you just take, everyone is a CFO. Everyone has an MBA and is a CFO, right? And then you know, that's what's driving your business, not innovation. If you want innovation and vision, if you want strategic vision in an area, you should uh, hire in the, the guys that know the area, right? And then make sure that they channel all the ideas through the CFO who will tell them no. They don't have to all be CIOs, right? CFOs, right? You know, you can be happy with a budget and a PowerPoint juggler, but, but not in the long run. You need the impact. That's, I think that's important, actually. I've seen that in other organizations where you have CIOs that, that don't know IT and they're just translating complex things into very simple PowerPoints, presenting it to other SMEs that actually were like, hey, we know that the, the specifics of this, we need something more specific. You, you, you shouldn't have just budget generalists in these C-level positions. You have to have to bet on a, an art character, right? Yeah. Uh, basically. Further to what Lassie said, for me, the one thing that is critical is just being a lifelong learner. You got to continue to learn and read and keep yourself educated and be aware of everything that's going on. So even though you might have graduated now or a recent graduate or you've been in the industry for you know a, a long time, there is no replacement for learning and continuously evolving and, 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 and bettering yourself. And, and then some of it is also going to come with experience. Like as Lassie said, you've got to have that battle hardened experience to get to the C level. And you can't just expect that, oh, I've graduated tomorrow, but I want to become the CIO. Like that's not how it works. Unfortunately, you have to go through some battles. You know, you can be a great, uh, the, the great general has actually been a foot soldier at one point, has actually been in the battle leading, leading sort of the charge and, and then getting experience from that. So there's no substitute for that but continue to be a lifelong learner would be the thing that I would, I would leave. Yeah, I, I just also like to say, you know, the CIO is just not, not just about being, you know, someone who reads Gartner, you know, cause then you'll be implementing drone swarms <laughs> into everything. Right. And that's, that's not the point, right. You have to know a little bit about what's up and down here. What does it mean to have an on-prem server? How, what does it take to move it? Right. Uh, but I agree with what Deepak is saying is you have to have lifelong learning. I think that's what you always have to do. You know, remember you're always a sinner, right. Uh, you have to learn more. You have to all constantly redeem yourself. That way, I'm I'm extremely Protestant. I think. <laughs> Sorry about that, <laughs> but uh, but uh, but uh, you know that's the anxiety, but that's also the drive, right? That's good. So yeah, Deepak, uh, thanks to the audience for the overwhelming questions, but we are so short on time. Uh, Deepak, let's say phenomenal candid conversation. I just loved. I wish we had two hours, but time is a limit. It's finite. And I really appreciate you both taking time. Uh, for the audience, this podcast will be recorded and paid. And then uh, we will be going live next month. Uh, next month, we are having a chief data officer or the data strategist from UK. And then we'll be talking more a little bit about data side. But happy to have all of you, you know, absolutely no words to thank you. Yeah, two things, if we have to end it up, the art of learning and battle-hardened experience. That's a message Deepak and Les have given us. Thank you all. Thanks for joining. Thank you all. Pleasure. Bye. Thank you, Guy. And feel free to ask questions in LinkedIn or wherever, right? Yep. Yeah. Lance is a phenomenal speaker. You can see his passion already here. It's all vibrancy. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you, guys. All right. Thank you, Thank Mike. You, Bye. 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 B